through chapter 4 this morning, part 9, as we continue in this series together, uh, this very important series we've entitled Faithfulness in Affliction. Paul is writing this letter to a church that is a new church, one year old, a church that he helped start in the midst of great trial, in the midst of great suffering and affliction. We've seen this theme woven throughout the pages of this letter. And today, as we've seen how the people of God have been faithful and have called to be even more faithful in the days ahead, we have been challenged together. We have been challenged to learn what it means to walk in troubled times in a way that glorifies God. So today, the theme that we want to pick up on is growing in love and growing in labor. Part of being faithful is growing. Some of you may remember the great Jamaican athlete, the 11-time world champion, Usain Bolt. Really an amazing, amazing hero and competitor. It took less than 10 seconds, 9.58 seconds to be exact, for this Jamaican sprinter to cover the 100-meter distance on the Olympic track to win the gold medal in Berlin, Germany in the year 2009. It's an amazing accomplishment. I can't even imagine. It's very important to say when we celebrate heroes who have overcome obstacles and succeeded in life and been victorious, that the race was not run, was not won in those 9.58 seconds. The race was won over years Months, days, hours of practice, working out, weightlifting, special dieting, coaching. Usain Bolt won that race not by running 10 seconds that day, but by persevering and hard work and growing as an athlete and as an individual. He didn't start running at 9.58 seconds. It took years of labor and growth to get to that point. I mentioned that today because for many of us, we look at the Christian life as kind of a stagnant, complacent, stillborn kind of faith. And the reality is, no, it is the very opposite. It is a faith of labor and love and growth in order to stand strong in these days. I think of the Russian novelist and philosopher, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who said these words, if we are deprived of meaningful work, men and women lose their reason for existence and they will go stark, raving mad. What words there by that philosopher? I think there's a lot of truth in that very powerful statement. If we are not growing in love and labor, if we don't have purpose, if we're not pushing forward, if we're not looking to the prize ahead, we're going to be going backwards. There is no neutrality. There is no just sitting still in life, and especially the Christian life. Back in chapter 3, verse 10, Paul told the church he wanted to come to them because he wanted to complete what was lacking in the church of Thessalonica. Now he specifically is going to point out two things that need to grow in their lives, and I would say grow in our lives as well, that of love and that of labor. Again, to bloom where they are planted, in the very community they live in. Friends, it's important to know that hard work and labor our Monday through Friday lives should not be separate from our Christian life. In fact, that is where we live out what we confess every single Sunday. I think of the great Anglican reformer, Hugh Latimer, bishop in England. He said, it is a wonderful thing that Jesus, the Savior of the world and the King above all kings, was not ashamed to labor and to use so simple an occupation, that of a carpenter like his father. He says, here Jesus did sanctify all manners of occupations, including teachers and salespersons and maintenance men and women and military 
and healthcare workers and grandparents. Some of you are full time in that one. And clerks and homeschool moms and secretaries and business people and contractors and whatever your vocation is. God has not called us to be stagnant in our work week and in our lives. Just like we're to grow in the Christian faith, that includes love and in our labor. So wherever you're at today, I want to challenge you from these words to see where you need to grow. Hear with me the word of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll pick up in verse 7. The letter says, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but rejects God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are all in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. This is the word of the Lord. We pick up in verse 8. He who rejects this does not reject man, but God. What does he mean, reject? The word reject has the idea of nullifying something, dismissing something. I dare say in our modern world, canceling something, disregarding and despising something. If you cancel, disregard what God has said, Houston, we have a problem. That's what this is saying here. So immediately as we jump back in the 1 Thessalonians 4, we have to ask, what is Paul worried about us rejecting? What is he worried about us canceling? We heard a great message last week, and I want to review just a few points very briefly to set the stage for where he goes in these verses. Remember how the chapter began in verse 2. Paul said, church, you know the instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, the commands that were given the church. In other words, this whole chapter has a context of God speaking to his people, of God giving them specific, clear truths that they are to follow, instructions, commands. Someone once said, the Bible is basic instructions before leaving the earth. Now, that is a, you know, that's a Christian cliche, cliche if I've ever heard one, okay? But they are our instructions in the Word of God. That is a true statement. And there are things that we have to ask ourselves this morning. Do I believe these things by faith in my heart and accept them and follow them? Or am I rejecting them? Am I canceling them with my life and with my mind and heart? So disregard what? Well, there was a lot of things he brought up in verse 3. He commanded specifically to abstain from fornication or sexual immorality. Now remember, Thessalonica was a pagan city in Europe. It was a city that did not have the blessing of having a Judeo culture. Or as our country has had some sort of a Judeo-Christian type background. Immoral behavior was indulged and normalized in Thessalonica. Daily, they were exposed to it. Daily, there was sin just flagrantly and openly exposing itself and parading itself on the streets. And Paul here is saying, hey, church, just because you're surrounded by darkness does not mean you have to retreat, abandon what you believe, abandon what God has said. In fact, you are to do the very opposite. You are, going to you are to abstain or have nothing to do with, stay completely away from that which pollutes the soul. Now, Thessalonica was a city full of sexual activity that deviated from God's one and only perfect plan of a relationship between a husband and wife. Founded in creation, 
kept throughout the annuals of history. It is the only relationship, the only relationship in terms of sexuality outside of singleness that is honored in Scripture by God. The Lord blesses the relationship of a husband and wife. We are told in Hebrews 13, verse 4, marriage is held in honor among all. The marriage bed is undefiled. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus chose to take his first miracle into the world at a wedding, a marriage in Cana of Galilee? To honor marriage as good, as holy, as something to be celebrated. Now, in contrast to that, the city of Thessalonica was full of all kinds of disordered and sinful practices. Fornication, all right, immoral behavior outside of marriage, adultery, the breaking of the marital bounds, pedophilia, transvestitism, men dressing like women and women dressing like men, adultery, homosexuality, pornography were everywhere in Thessalonica. Those were not the exceptions. Those seemed to be the norms when you walk the streets of the city. I've traveled in different cities around the world, and I've noticed that there is differences in cultures around the world. While we all have a conscience, and God has given us knowledge in our hearts, and we know that sin is sin, there are sins that are clearly known by all peoples everywhere. It's interesting when you travel in certain cities where there's less of a respect or honor of God, less of a foundation of His Word. You will see prostitution openly on the streets. You will see pornography exposed and celebrated from the lowest shopkeeper to the largest billboard right out in the open air. I've seen it with my own eyes, and unfortunately, I've had to close my eyes and look the other way a lot, doing mission trips in other places. So understand that what we have in America, for most of us here, we grew up in an age where there were certain things, at least, that were taboo in the open street. That was never the case in Thessalonica. When Paul and Silas and Timothy planted the church there, they were rescuing people out of pornography and sexual immorality. I have no doubt, just like now today in America, many of the new Christians in Thessalonica had lived in immoral relationships in the past. Men had mistresses outside of their wives. Women had engaged in fornication outside of their husbands or outside of the marital relationship. This was not exceptional. This was normalized behavior. So the second instruction in verse 4 was, each one of you in the midst of a world that has canceled what God said, has rejected what God has said, needs to know how to possess your own vessel or to control your own body. Thessalonica sounded pretty much like American television. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. Control is not important. Follow your feelings no matter where they lead you. And yet the reality is, friends, sexual sin, whether you watch it in private, in secret in your home, whether you're having private relationships on a device, or it's something that you do with your body. Sexual sin is not a servant that you control. It is a powerful master that controls you. It is not a sin that is easily controlled. Instead, all Christians must know the importance of disciplining their bodies so they will honor God. Too many Christian kids and teenagers today ask the question, and adults, I'll add for that matter, how far can I go before it's a sin or before it really disqualifies me or it hurts me? It's not the question to be asking. The question is not, how much sin can I indulge in before it's too much and someone's going to say something to me? Friends, rather we should separate from immoral behavior because it honors God, because God is our good Father. And Jesus Christ died for those sins. And so again, I ask you the words of the evangelist, are the sins you are living for worth Christ dying for? Are they? And if they are uh, not, why are you still doing it? I say to our teenagers in the room today, those of you who are single in the church but do not have the gift of singleness, meaning 
you're praying and looking for a spouse today. Remember that the physical relationship you might have with someone today could be someone else's future or husband or wife tomorrow. And you might be someone else's future husband or wife tomorrow. Remember that, right? Honor God. Know how to have control. Verse 5, one more command. Not in the passion of lust, uncontrollable desires, compelling feelings and urges, letting urges and feelings control you instead of faith and faithfulness. Friends, verse 8, where our sermon actually begins today, says, if you are not in control, if you are rejecting and canceling what God has said, you are not rejecting man, you are rejecting God. I point out this phrase because these aren't the, the pastor's standards of morality. All right, It really doesn't matter what my standard is or how far I think is too far. This is not the apostle's standard of morality. Uh, Paul and Peter and John didn't get together and play rock, paper, scissors to determine how far is too far. Okay, It's just not the way it went. They didn't make this up. It is not the church elders. It is not the, the pastors. By the way, teenagers, it's not your parents' laws of morality. Now, your parents hopefully have some laws. That's a good parent, not a bad parent. But understand, Paul is saying here, it is not man you are rejecting. It is God you are rejecting. If you are following the motto of it feels good, do it. You are behaving in a disordered, sinful, rebellious passion that needs to be brought under Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and his lordship. We often become numb and blind, drifting through life into foolish, vain pursuits that are slowly poisoning our soul and they are toxic to our self. Listen, these things here, walking in holiness, doing the work of God, these are commands, instructions. These are not options. Notice it says, by the way, in verse 8, that if you reject this, you're not rejecting man. You are rejecting God. Why is that important to note? Because, number one, it's not man-made rules and regulations. These aren't downers to, to keep you back. These are blessings. These are blessings for your soul. And secondly, when it says you're rejecting God, who gives us the Holy Spirit, this is also affirming to us that Jesus Christ is God. You see, in John 15, Jesus said, the helper is going to come and I'm going to send him to you from the Father. So when it makes this statement, it is proof that Jesus is God. And again, you are disregarding, you are rejecting, you are canceling what Jesus has done for you on the cross and what he says for you in his world, his word. Are the sins you are living for worth Christ dying for? By the way, Paul sees something very clearly here that modern atheists see and a lot of religious people reject. Notice here, the atheist, in order to justify behaviors, set aside God. And they say there is no God. Or if they're an agnostic atheist, which is more, uh, very much more available in terms of philosophy today, Agnostic atheists say, we don't know if there is a God. So because we don't know, we're going to set him aside. Which, by the way, my answer is always, how much knowledge of the world do you really have, atheist agnostic friend? Do you know like 5% of all the knowledge in the world? 10% of all the knowledge in the world? I'm going to make you really smart and say, you know 20% of all the language, history, culture, customs, educational standards in the world. That would make you like super genius, all right? Einstein on steroids, all right? So, you know 20% of all the knowledge in the world. Is it possible that God is very clearly existent in the other 80% you're not aware of yet? Ah, uh, yeah. He actually is in the 20% you think you know too. See, you're actually rejecting him. You're setting him aside. Uh, there's a reason why atheists don't hate leprechauns, right? There's a reason why atheists don't hate fairies. 
Don't hate wizards, right? They're not in a great demand fighting the idea of magic or something like that, okay? Their battle is against theism, the one true living God. Now, what is so interesting here is that religious people today are the very opposite. They justify their evil behavior and say they believe in God. No, you are rejecting him. You have walked away and you are attacking what he has said if you do not surrender. Notice he's given us his Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're struggling with these sins, and I know like I started this sermon off pretty deep and heavy and hard hitting, but I want to say to you, the good news is I'm not telling you, you just have to be a more spiritual, holy person and this is easy to do. I'm not telling you that. I'm not saying, come see me for counseling, and I'm going to give you 16 rules to celibacy, and 36 rules to avoid fornication, and 43 ways to be a a, a picture-perfect Christian. It's not what I'm saying. And that's really good, because I hate 43 rules of anything, okay? What I'm saying here is what God says. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us his word to empower us, to direct us. You don't have to get creative or be all-powerful. You just got to be humble before God. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Romans 8 says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit, you can put to death the deeds of the body and you will live. Notice verse 9. But concerning brotherly love... You know, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Now we get to the heart of the message right here. So if we're not supposed to live immoral lives, unholy lives, how do you live a holy life? How do you stay pure? How do you grow closer to God in your heart and in your actions Well, you have to replace immoral behavior, passions of lust, stagnancy with growth. Growth in love, we're going to see first, and secondly, growth in labor. Notice, concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you because you are taught by God. Now, you all know the the word here, brotherly love in Greek. It's the word Philadelphia. The so-called city of brotherly love. Well, this word here in the New Testament is talking about love in the family of God. It's talking about how brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, we are a family here. I'm excited. We got to meet with some uh, candidates for membership. They had their final meeting this morning. Next week, they joined the church. And I told them this morning, you are not a number. We're not bringing you in as a number. We're family. Family blows it sometimes. Family messes up sometimes. Family doesn't pick up the phone enough sometimes, but guess what? When the going gets tough, we will stick together. Amen. And you got to let us know when we blow it too. <laughs> That's okay. We'll see that in a moment. But the point is we are a family. There is brotherly love here. And he says, I don't have to write to you as I did on all the other points because you are taught by God. If you are God's child, you know that you're to love one another. It's a part of who we are. It's part of our identity. By the way, it's important to say the Bible does not tell us ever to be nice. All right? There's too many Christians that mistake love for being nice. Everybody at that church is so nice. I don't know what that means, but it kind of scares me a little bit. All right? Love is the attribute we're looking for here, not niceness. The the gospel itself teaches us to love one another. This is a mark of a Christian. 1 John says, we know we have passed out of death into life because we love brothers and sisters. And if you don't love, you abide in death. God himself, when he entered our lives and changed us, he begins this work of helping us to love the unlovable and even to love ourselves in the right way, right? Right? Love one another as Christ has loved you. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're not talking about some sort of a a self-centered, egocentrical, megalomaniac self-esteem. We're talking about a healthy self-esteem. I am comfortable in my skin who God has made me, what God has gifted me with, what God has called me to. That's the kind of self-love I'm talking about, not the world self-love. 
drama. I don't want to. I was going to say drama queen. That's not politically correct anymore. Drama kings. I'm going to pick on the men. All right, you drama kings out there, you. So, the reality here is that. We are taught by God from our conversion to do this. And it's a kind of love that's greater than anything the world offers because Jesus said, not just love those who like you or love those who are in your family. He even said in Matthew 5, love your who? Your enemies and pray for those who come against you. That's powerful. Now he says in verse 10, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. And we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more in your love, that you grow more and more in your love, that you abound. In other words, the Thessalonians' love is there, and it's good, but it's not perfect. There's room to grow in love, and I would say to you, there's room for us as a church to grow in love. Notice he says, your love is toward all the brethren, rich or poor, greater or lesser believers, No matter what your so-called race is, or more biblically, your ethnicity, which is a gift of God, should be celebrated, right? Their love is extensive. It goes throughout Macedonia, he says. Distance makes no difference. Arab Christians in Iraq and Egypt and Syria. Believers in India and Sri Lanka and Kyrgyzstan and Asia. Latin American Christians in countries like Brazil or Guatemala. Christians in African nations, Christians in North America, wherever you are, it needs to increase. You've got it, it needs to grow. So I want to pause for just a minute or two and say, if you're fighting those sins, and the way you fight those sins is you grow in love, how do you grow in love? Because he doesn't exactly give us, he doesn't spell it out totally here. How do you grow in love? A checklist, an analysis. I want to run through a few ideas with you before we talk about growing in labor as we close. Number one, one way to grow in love is to build up one another. First Thessalonians 5, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. The word encourage comes from an old French word that means make strong, to fortify something that's there. When we encourage one another, when we build one another up, we are fortifying each other. This is selfless. This is increasing someone else outside of you. Parents, when was the last time you spoke words of life building up your children? I've talked to a lot of kids whose parents have tore them down. When was the last time you built them up? When was the last time you found a coworker? And even though there was a lot of mess in their life, there was something you saw there. You saw the light of God. You saw the grace of Christ. Did you build them up? Did you strengthen what was in them? So many people live in teardown land. They never do any building for the kingdom of God. Their spiritual uh, existence is nothing but a wilderness of decay and, and rot and brokenness. But we are called to build one another up. It is loving to stop talking about yourself and to talk about somebody else. It's loving. It's how you do it. Secondly, you show kindness. Okay? Kindness includes thinking about the other person more than you think about yourself and putting it into action. In other words, you look at them and you say, what are their needs? How can I serve them? It doesn't have to be something huge. It has to be something thoughtful, meaning you're intentionally being kind to one another as Christ has forgiven us. Assisting someone in their distress, helping someone in their weakness. When was the last time you were just simply kind? I told you that niceness is not a Christian virtue. Kindness is, though. Kindness is something we are called to do. How about this one? When was the last time you counseled somebody else, instructed somebody else? Paul says in Romans 15 that we should be filled with all knowledge and be able to instruct one another. That's loving. It's loving to speak truth to someone else when they're in error. It's important to do that. How will they ever grow if they don't know? 
to encourage and comfort one another. Here's a big one. Listen, slow down, ask questions. Don't ask questions just so you can formulate a response. Ask questions because you have actual sympathy and you actually care and kindness for them. Allow people to speak without interruption so that you can instruct them properly. I was talking to the husbands in the room when I said without interruption, okay? Without interruption. How about this one? Bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, if anyone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too are tempted. Bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Too many of us give up too quickly on one another. We don't help take the pain and the problems and the burden off someone else. We tend to heap more burdens on them. People that need help, they need someone to lift their arms up, someone to get the weight off their back. Who was the last time you took the weight off someone's back or off their conscience or off their heart? By helping them intentionally. This is how you grow in love. How about giving sacrificially to meet someone else's needs? 1 John 3. By this we know love. That Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters in the, the family of God. If anyone has the world's goods. That means if you got cash. Cash app, Venmo, credit cards, whatever. And you see your brother or sister in need. Yet you close your heart against them. How does God's love abide in you? Can you think of a time in your life when someone showed you such generosity and you still say, wow, I can't believe they did that for me. Can't believe it. I remember a couple years back, someone showed up and put a card in my office. They snuck it in there. And I was like, wow, how in the world did that just happen? No idea who. They didn't take any credit for it. Mind-blowing, encouraging. Maybe it was a gift of their time when you needed someone desperately and someone was willing to set their stuff aside to come help you. Maybe it was kind words or standing up for you in a difficult time. When was the last time you opened your heart and you were generous to someone else? How about this one? Welcome one another, Romans 15, as Christ has welcomed you. Be willing to embrace people as they really are. In other words, when they are a mess, not when they've got it all worked out and cleaned up. God doesn't play favoritism. We look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. In his work, in the family of God, it's all of grace. Unmerited, unearned, undeserved. Give preference to one another. When was the last time you brought someone out of your clique, out of your social unit, out of your normal people, into your home, into your life? When was the last time you talked to someone on the other side of the aisle? Someone with a different political view than your own. It's okay if you know you're still right, okay? <laughs> but when did you reach out to them and help them? When was the last time you saw that there was a disagreement, but the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all those sins? And so you gave preference to them. This is the Christian cliche one. Cliche one. Pray for one another. Hebrews 13 the writer of Hebrews says, pray for us. A.W. Pink says, the measure of our love for others can largely be determined by the frequency and earnestness of our prayers for them. If someone mentions they're sick, they're stressed, they're excited, when was the last time you said, can I pray with you? Now, how can I pray for you today? And then you actually prayed for them. And you checked back up with them a day later or a week later, continuing your prayer. Lastly, if you want your love to grow, practice hospitality. And I love this, 1 Peter 4, 9, because I love the end of it, because he had some of us in mind here. Show hospitality 
without grumbling. In other words, it's not opening your door. It's the minute before you open the door and you say, why are those people here? (laughs) I didn't invite them and I don't want them here. Right? Without grumbling, really? Like, sincerely, that's stretching your love. Nothing fancy. Doesn't have to be anything amazing. It's making a plate of cookies and dropping it off to someone. It's buying a family that needs food pizza and showing up at the door to drop it off. It's inviting people over to your home for something simple. Coffee. For a bottle of water and just time to talk together and catch up. When you're dropping off that food for that family that's sick, don't just drop it off. Stand and talk for a bit if they would like that. Unless they have COVID, of course, and you can talk through the door or something. Love people outside of your own social circles. How about the kids of the church? When was the last time you stopped and looked eye level at one of the kids here in this church and asked how they're doing? And invited their parents over, even though their parents are 30 years younger than you. Or those parents have teenagers and you only have little ones. Or you have the teenagers and they only have the little ones. Love people that don't look like you, that don't have the same culture as you. Find those who are single in our church and encourage them. And those of you who are single, encourage the weary here, whether they're homeless or they're wealthy. Friends, we are told to love fervently in the Bible. That means to stretch out the limits of love for one another. Do it. Step out and do it. Grow in love. But then this text ends in verses 11 and 12. And I I do want to read these two verses with you. Again, look what it says there. Aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. What is your aspiration? What is your aim? In contrast to the world's aim, the world's aim is reject what God said, cancel what God has said and done, do it my way, if it feels good, do it. Instead, make it your aim to do this. Number one, lead a quiet life. The old King James said, study to be quiet. While there is a great urgency in the gospel, Christians are not supposed to be known as big mouth, ostentatious, self-absorbed people, self-asserting people. We are supposed to be known as humble, as quiet, as still and knowing that he is God. Not giving to unnecessary conflict and hostility. Not encouraging factions and divisions and animosities and contentions and gossip. Not being restless people that don't know how to, every Lord's Day, sit and hear from God. Getting all stirred up about the wrong things during the week. I really don't care right? About all that stuff. I want to know what God has said for my life and rest in that. He says, aspire or get stirred up about being calm, about being quiet. This means don't be arrogant, thinking you have it all figured out, meddling all the time in others' lives. Lead a quiet life. Listen, Satan is very busy trying to disquiet us. Satan wants to disquiet you. He wants your soul torn up. He wants you believing everything you read on Facebook and everything you hear at the 6 p.m. news. He wants you brainwashed, self-absorbed, doubting, fearful, and hiding from the real world. It's not what God wants at all. He's talking about a quiet life in the heart. He's talking about not being a troublemaker. 1 Timothy 5 talks about women in the church that had been idle. Because they were idle, they were going from house to house and they were gossiping and being busybodies, saying things they should not say. And by the way, that is not just a woman problem. (laughs) That's a man problem too, which is why 1 Peter says, if you're insulted in the name of Christ, Make sure you're insulted and suffering, not because you're a murderer, not because you're a thief, not because you're an evildoer, and not because, men, you're meddlers, all right? Meddling is not a Christian virtue, simply not. 
There's too much positive work for the kingdom of God to do. People that meddle have too much time on their hands. Mind your own business. In other words, too many people that meddle aren't loving the people around them, aren't loving their families, aren't loving the people at their workplace. This is talking about impertinent and unauthorized prying into the lives of others. It's an undisciplined life, 2 Thessalonians 3 says. F.F. F. Bruce has written here, there is a great difference between the Christian duty of putting the interest of others first and the busybody's compulsive itch to put other people right. Listen, we are called to work with our hands here. We are called to be busy doing the work of God in the world. It's interesting that God came, the king of the universe came and became a humble carpenter for 30 years. That God called humble fishermen to be apostles. That God raised up tent-making missionaries like Paul. And teenage shepherds like David. Paul may have written these words after just working on a tent for somebody. God made everything good, and the most menial task can be done for the glory of God with the touch of our Creator's hand and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Paul's antidote for unwise, undisciplined behavior was to stop being a busybody and take your work, your calling, your Monday through Friday, and to invest it for the kingdom of God. Or as Ephesians 4 says, do honest work with your own hands. Work with your own hands, it says here. Too many people are committed to idleness and slothfulness and laziness. This leads to sexual sin. This leads to impurity. Listen, late nights playing on phones, teenagers. Always being in isolation from others. Not keeping busy leads to wandering minds and hearts. Laziness is the practice of resting before you ever got tired. There's too many of us committed to that practice. I think of the story of a mother who told me she had walked into her teenage son's weight room and she was watching him work out on the bench press and he was uh, moving through these heavy repetitions and she said to him, why is it you can lift nearly 200 pounds but you can't pick up the clothes off the floor in your bedroom? (laughs) Ronald Reagan once said, I've heard that hard work never killed anyone but I say, why take the chance? Too many of you are living that motto today. We must recognize the dignity and honor of work. Listen, grow in love, but also grow in what God's called you to do. Be the best employee you can be. That honors God. That serves Christ. That keeps you out of sin and trouble. We fall into Satan's snare when we expect things to always come easily. If I just pray, it's all going to work out. Pray Augustine says, yes, but then work as hard as if everything depended on you. Give your all for God's kingdom. The Welsh Puritan Vassavor Pal said, slothfulness is the cradle of sin and the devil rocks it. Laziness is the cradle the devil will rock. Friends, Thomas Brooks said, an idle life and a holy heart It's a contradiction. A loafer cannot show forth the life of Christ, okay? We need Christians again who are working hard, not just for themselves, but for their families, for the next generation, for the the shalom, the peace of our city. We need Christians again founding businesses that glorify God, being the employee everybody wants because they honor God with their words in life and they're honest. Starting ministry, starting businesses, starting Christian schools like Pro Reggae Christian School, like libraries and hospitals, and sending forth the gospel to the world right where we live. Idle people will always tempt the devil to tempt them. This is why verse 12 ends here, and it says, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and you would lack nothing. 
I want to tell you, friends, God, Martin Luther said, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. Friends, there are so many people around us, like the Thessalonian world, trapped in all kinds of terrible sins. Their life is a mess. Things are hard. The world is broken. Those on the outside don't need us discrediting the gospel by lacking love and by lacking the kind of labor that pleases God. You have a mission field Monday morning, and it's not necessarily getting on a plane and traveling to Sri Lanka or, or Kyrgyzstan or traveling uh, to Guatemala or whatever country churches go on mission trips all the time. Your mission field is where you are tomorrow. Listen to me. Jesus lived a holy life. He had no sin. Total purity inside and out, unlike us. Jesus lived a life of love. His life was to seek and save the lost and love the unlovable. And Jesus lived a life of labor. He worked and worked and sweat even drops of blood and gave his all on the cross to set us free. And so as Ephesians 5 says, may we also walk in love just like Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God. Brothers and sisters, this is our call. Let us pray.